Hey comment, it's me. Hi guys and welcome again to my video. So today as promised, I will be talking about Insta posts, which is actually what I should be talking about last week, but since I already made a video about something else, I decided to postpone it. To be honest, there's a lot of things that I want to say, there's a lot of things that I haven't expressed. Even to this week, I still found something new that people say about the video. But since the professor have already apologized about her statement, I hope that people who agree with the professor at the very least try to understand where we're coming from, why we disagree with what she said. The aftermath of this issue is just super duper ugly. It is not pretty at all. As a matter of fact, I have a friend that has even recently approached me about it and was like, hey, why are you so emotional about it? It's like, um, have you even watched the video? I was like, yeah, I watched the video. It's because I watched the video that I'm so pissed at the statement. I'm here not to talk about that. I'm here to talk about Insta poems. So let's just get right into it. So today, uh, I actually read these poetry books during Ramadan. I should be focusing on Muslim poets, modern Muslim poets to be exact. We're not gonna go with Rumi. Here's the thing about me. I might be studying English literature right now. You can give me the novel the size of an Oxford dictionary, but you give me like a two stanza poem, it might be... I might take longer time with the poem. There will always be some things that I miss. I find poetry such a powerful piece of writing. There are lots of things that you can convey in just very few words. I think it's just amazing how these writers can achieve that because I cannot, for the life of me, do that. <laughs> I tried dabbling in poetry like when I was in school and when I look back at my old works, I just feel like, wow, these are so bad. I, I wrote poetry for my friends, their birthday, and it's just for special occasions. Well, mostly for myself, and then I realized that I suck. <laughs> and I'm so sorry for my friends for having to put up with my bad writing. Which is the reason why I actually appreciate the Insta poetry movement. Everyone knows that Rupi Kaur is the forefront of Insta poetry. Despite the criticism that she received, I feel like this is probably a great contribution to the world of literature. It, it is not the best, and I would never ever equate Insta poetry to poetry. I mean, Insta poetry is like trying to be art, but just not yet. They're not the same levels. Insta poetry is like a student, you know, a level one player, while actual poetry is like the final boss. You get me, you get what I mean. Which is the reason why I'm not doing poems for my thesis. I'd rather analyze three to five novels than a single book of poetry. Which is the reason why I think the Insta poetry movement is great. It is the right thing for people who are intimidated by actual poetry and yet still interested in it. Even though I wasn't very impressed with Rupi's work, but I still think that you can find some gems in there. So enough introduction. Today we will be discussing six books by four different Insta poets. Uh, so those poets are F.S. Yusuf, Sana Abulaya, Nairia Wahid, Nairia Wahid, Nairia or Nairia, and lastly Unaharnor. We will be starting with works of F.S. Yusuf. I got three books by F.S. Yusuf, and yes, he only have written three, three books so far. So we're gonna start with his first ever release, his debut, which is Euphoria. He writes of a journey dedicated to growth, mental illness, spirituality, and self-reflections. Filled with various poems and topics, these collections will surely give you different emotions, ones which you wouldn't expect otherwise. I wish I could agree, but unfortunately, I... not really. It got an average of 3.7 on Goodreads, which I think is still quite good. Uh, the book is thankfully short. 
I love that he talks about a lot of issues that he talks about his personal stuff, his relationship with his family, his relationship with God, and I can relate to a lot of these issues. Unfortunately, I find that, well, since this is, after all, his debut collection, I find that the language that he used can be a little bit simplistic. The logic just doesn't resonate with me. Alright, so for instance, like this one, 7, 12, 17, 5, 44 p.m. You once told me that you disliked when I bought you flowers. They live for a couple of days and then they die and that hurts me. Bring me a plant instead so it can grow into something beautiful. Fresh cut flowers are pleasant, but the happiness that comes from maintaining and cherishing an item with vulnerability seems to last longer. Of the logic behind it that I find a bit weird. He's directing this to someone, to a woman, and that this woman told him that she disliked flower bouquet because they die and that she prefers potted plants, you know, so it can grow into something beautiful, which I think, yeah, I, I agree with that. But I really find that the symbol, the symbolic of the potted plant is that they just live longer, you know, instead of just having to throw away the flower in the trash, it's just, it, it, it's sad, okay? Fresh cut flowers are pleasant, but the happiness that comes from maintaining and cherishing an item with vulnerability seems to last longer. I disagree with this one highly because, I mean like sure, I am going to kill a bunch of flowers just so I can feel good about maintaining them. This one just, I don't know, leave me, leaves me with a bad taste. Let me know if you can actually decipher this better than I do because I, I, I don't get it. I don't get why he's thinking this way. There are others also that made me feel like, okay, I cannot understand with the logic but uh, let's move on, all right? So another thing that I kind of feel weirded about is the way that the poetries are arranged. The poetries are not sorted by themes or by uh, timelines or something. Like for example, like I think there's, I don't remember which collection that I read, but it was sorted according to say uh, plants according to like seeds okay you start with the seed and then you grow with a and then you have the stalk and then you have the buds and then you have the flowers so, so yeah it is sorted like that i find that really beautiful there's some also sorted by timeline like say like childhood adolescence and adulthood which is well it is it is pretty good but um well i get it that his book is very short but yet at the same time i can't help but feel like you could actually sort it out at first i was thinking that way after i finished reading it and, and process it i realized that he's not arranging it in a way that i thought he would that i thought he should he's actually arranging it in a way that forces me to reflect on his poems like say for example uh, there's this one poem called Growth. The act of an apology does not hold the power to instantly heal, but it gives enough momentum to start moving forward. The art of forgiveness. So then there's the other poem titled Forgiveness in the later parts. There are times when I wanted the worst for you, hoping you would understand. The roots are my thoughts. I needed you to feel the pain I held. But here I am, praying you never feel like I did. Hoping no one ever sees you like the way you saw me. I'm giving a lot of leeway for this. I mean, the criticism for Insta poems that they tend to be super duper lazy. As I progress further into the collection, I notice that poems in the later parts of the books relate to poems in the earlier parts of the book. They're kind of paired together. It shows kind of a way of progression. In a, in a way, it's actually great. It's actually great that he's arranging this way. It's unexpected. It's like you can't just simply, you know, pick a section and like, okay, I'm going to relate. I'm going to read this section. No, you have to work your way into piecing the puzzle. I might suck at analyzing poem, but I can say this with utter certainty. 
that I know when someone's trying. Right now, when I look at Euphoria, I just don't see him trying at the very least the level of Mr. Poem should. He's talking about a lot of important issues here like his personal relationship with his mother, his absent father, and then his girlfriend, and then his faith with God. I find those those issues are still better than a lot of other people writing about daddy issues and stuff. Wait a minute. I'm hopeful. Yes, I am hopeful for today. Today. A lot of these poems are not even poems. They're just like one statement or maybe one or two statements that he split and then invented to make it look like a poem. For example, like uh, this one called Detrimental. I will care for you in every possible way I can. But when your negativity starts to seep into my well-being, that is when I have to let go. It just feels like he's writing one or two sentences and he's like, wait, ta-da, poetry. My man, it doesn't work that way. Another thing that I find interesting is that there's this one poem that reminds me of another Insta poet's style. This one called uh, Conform. Through abuse and hurt, I was taught to stay silent. My emotions were never to reach the surface. They were to remain in the depths of my being, for letting them out would be unlawful. Masculinity. It reminds me of the collection by Michaela Angamir called When He Leaves You. Now, here's the thing about her poems is that she puts the title not at the top but at the bottom. You can consider the title as either the last line of the poem or the title of the poem itself or sometimes both. It is an interesting way to make the title as part of the poem itself. It actually functions to end your poem. I mean, sometimes when you see titles of the poems mentioned in the poem itself, it's usually like as a passing moment. A lot of the poems from Ma Michaela Angamir is that she puts them at the end and then it made you question yourself like is that the title because a lot of times they were italicized or it's just or is it just serves as the final line of the prose for example like this one baby i've always felt a connection with the sea but how is it that you summon an ocean between my legs without even touching me now when she italicized the line without even touching me well I thought it's just like a way to emphasize that how the guy's effect on her is just really massive like just by him probably looking at her and she's immediately like I'm talking wop 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 At the very least that's how I see it Another example is I cleaned my apartment before you come over so you can't draw any conclusions from the mess Don't open the closet doors so you can say that, okay, she cleans her apartment, but it's not actually cleaning her apartment. She's just simply shoving all of the mess in the closet, you know, and she's like, wait, don't open the closet. Wait a minute. I'm hopeful. Yes, I am hopeful for today. Take this or, you know, you can still switch the line, don't open the closet to the top for it to function as like the title. Don't open the closet by Michaela Angamir. Now, back to the poem Conform. This is one of the things that I don't like about this collection is that time, he explains what he's trying to say instead of letting his readers work. Part of the fun of reading poetry is that you, as a reader, get to decide what the poems actually mean. Well, not like fully decide, but you can decipher it yourself. And that's part of the fun, you know? If you explain to your readers what you're actually talking about, then you kind of take the fun away from them. Even if you remove the line masculinity, I can still tell that he's actually referring to masculinity. Through abuse and hurt, I was taught to stay silent. My emotions were never to reach the surface. They were to remain in the depths of my being, for letting them out would be unlawful. He's probably grow up in a traditional household um, where 
you know men are supposed to be like you need to stay brooding and silent you have to keep your emotions at the surface like my household is not exactly traditional but i do have uh family members that still practice this i mean masculinity is great and all but to the point where you are forcing men to like push your emotions down it's it's not healthy all right so that's it for euphoria so now we're going to talk about his second book which is significantly shorter called sincerely so sincerely apparently is a collection that he dedicated to a girl named yustra which i assume to be his girlfriend his wife so here we go we have sincerely sincerely's length is half the length of euphoria euphoria has a hundred something page and sincerely only has like 50 page something depends on what kind of version that you got the whole collection is a love letter to this woman that's very sweet and all but i thank god that this is significantly shorter the weakness of dedicating 50 love poems to someone and then put it in the collection and sell it is that they tend to sound repetitive i was kind of zoning out but this collection is significantly better than euphoria it is definitely an improvement i have to applaud him for being able to improve himself in less than a year because euphoria was published in january of 2018 and sincerely was published later that year this is after all is his way of Searching for a profound way to propose to his love, F.S. Yusuf reread the letters she had written him. In them, he found his proposal as well as inspiration to write his own prose and poetry. From this inspiration, Sincerely was born. It carries message of positivity, hope, and most of all, true love, which I find really, really sweet. There's a lot of good insta poems here that I think if you are trying to write a love letter to your girlfriend, I think you can use this. Uh, some of them are have really good uh, description, like this one, Stamina. There have been numerous fights, some which have left us torn and thinking of our end. But love is not love without trials that test endurance. What would we be if we were to quit at the worst of moments? So I don't really feel like it ends well. But at the same time, I feel like there's an improvement in terms of shape, in terms of structure. Uh, and I say I hope that he keeps improving. So here, this one is a little bit of a puzzle. Uh, this one called An Ode to You. When I first saw you, I could hardly pull my eyes off you leaving me full of emotion, leaving me breathless. You left me wondering, over a hot cup of coffee, under the beaming sun outside my favorite cafe, maybe you could be the person I spent my life looking for and carried the power to change my life for the better. I rolled the dice once, I rolled the dice twice, and yet you would refuse to leave my mind. Maybe you could be good for me, even destiny could be pointing towards your name. At the bottom, he says, Now read every single letter at the beginning of each sentence. Will you marry me? Oh my god! That is so sweet. I, I'm genuinely surprised because I actually did not know this. I wasn't even bothered. The poems here are, some of them are actually longer. But I love the description that he used that he takes out a moment and then the way he described it is just really beautiful. For example, September 7, 2015, skipping over the bridge, hands wide up, grey cardigan drifting in the wind while I smiled behind you. Here I see someone, someone I had been patient with. For a long time, not a bad patient, but a good patient. I saw love blossom, like a rose in spring, firm, strong and beautiful. My heart beat for you, every second and every day. You leaned on me, and we talked about our days and what else we could accomplish. I felt your heart in sync with mine, and I never wanted to let go. Twirling hands in the air, dancing in the cool summer breeze, walking, talking, standing real close, 
I pray this is something that will get stronger as time goes. I love like the the use of love the blossom, spring, the seasons and the weather and the activities. I, I feel like it's just it feels refreshing and liberating. I mean again I emphasize that this is not it's actually like poetry, but I see some potential in this one if only like he took the time to actually polish it a little bit more. I think that he could do this the way uh, Edgar Allan Poe used to do this. Edgar Allan Poe actually wrote a poem to his lover. So yeah, this poem by Edgar Allan Poe is actually an acrostic poem and he, where he hides the name of his lover from the letters. Like you take out the first letter from the first line and then the second letter from the second line and so on and so forth. And I find that's really cool. I mean, it's not exactly rocket science, but I still think that it's good. So still, I wish that he could actually incorporate that instead of actually says, like gives an actual instruction. Maybe what he should have done is just randomly capitalize the letters in each line. And then, you know, maybe she sent something off and then she's put together a piece of the puzzle. It just feels a bit more earned in comparison to this one, right? So that's the only complaint that I have about this book. Otherwise, I mean, it is a slight improvement to what he did in Euphoria. I'm kind of excited to what he's doing next. So now Prayers of My Youth uh, have the highest ratings yet with the average of 4.39 stars. So in his third poetry collection, The Maturing Writer, F.S. Yusuf, displays some of his most powerful work in an autobiographical collection which revolves around spirituality, love, and finding oneself. Filled with longer poems, this is different from his previous works, as this one carries a story which others may struggle to tell. So I actually feel like impressed with this one. Well, it's not, it's still for me, it's not like amazing amazing but it is definitely his latest and his best i even give this one four stars what's important is that he's improving this one he did something that he did not do in the first two books which is he actually separates and divides the poem into stages of prayer you know i think that is really a good way for you to divide however uh i just find that the dividing it doesn't feel like the poems within that section doesn't feel like it matches the supposed theme itself so you have in the first section which is ablution which is what um which is the the act of washing oneself the first poem which is called maturation maturation even though we had departed i could never bring myself to wish bad upon you I would pray endlessly, no matter how many pins and needles would puncture my skin, no matter how many tears would leave burns on my body, because even though it was all I could do, it would give me peace knowing some good had happened to you. Now, ablution is the first stage of prayer, and yet he talks about being mature. I was expecting something along the lines of like he's trying to learn, you know, about growing up would go into the later stages of prayer. At the time when I when I read this, I feel like he's just randomly puts poems according to the stages of prayer. I mean, without the divider carrying significant weight. I look at my notes here and I realize that the poems are surprising surprisingly uh, diverse, which is always a good thing. I feel like. In to prevent people from getting bored. Yes, I, it should be diverse. You should talk about as much thing as possible. However, at the same time, if you're not able to actually write a good prose, it will end up being forgettable. You don't really leave an imprint on the person's mind with your writing. And the goal here, I think that Every writer's goal is to leave an impression. As I recall, I don't really feel like the collection leave any impression on me that much. Except for the fact that I appreciate that he divided the section 
according to Stages Prayer. His poems in here are definitely longer, which I think is a good thing because it feels like he's taking time to expand. Although I must emphasize that longer poems does not necessarily mean good. I love how he talks about personal experience as well. Uh, and here's the thing that I find really interesting is that there are times I don't like the whole poem. Like even if the poem's long, maybe my favorite would be like one stanza because of the description itself. I like beautiful descriptions. Uh, like this is one from a meaning is better than none. So he talks about how his conception. I picture the beginning of me being discussed over a cup of sweetened condensed milk filled chai. How you'd poetically lace your words in Urdu. Maybe it's time to have a son. We have had two daughters. I desire a son so I can teach my experiences too. And so the chai finishes and you both do as well. Or only you do. I am planted soulfully and while you write your own plans for me, another has already destined my life to unfold even before you can acknowledge that I exist. An entity derived from you was so drastically different from the way you imagined. And the day I was born, I was not only made from you, but I was stamped with the name you had chosen, the bringer of happiness and joy, a meaning I grew distant from, like a sinking ship separated from life and decaying into the depths of the unknown. The smiles you had lessened as time went on, and it seems I mirrored those gestures as well. The call to prayer being announced is my ears, when I have a single soul praying afterward. I am anxiously idling by, waiting for my prayer to begin, and not long after it would have begun, if only I did not hesitate in handing my life, the selfish, impulsive tendencies that reside in my body like a vital organ. And it seems ironic that one of the more damaging persons in my life could have given me a name with such a pleasant meaning, the bringer of happiness and joy. You find it ironic that the person who caused him sadness is the one who named him as bringer of happiness. And one of my favorite in this one is actually the kites of childhood in the earlier parts, okay? So here he talks about his memories with his father. My father used to bring home my father used to bring home kites from Pakistan, made out of colorful paper and thin sticks. Mine was pink and blue and caught my eye as soon as it was taken out. It was beautiful and I imagined it soaring through the skies, viewable from all the houses in town. The yarn was grey and had minuscule shards of glass woven within it. My father told me that it was for kite fighting, the way they used to do it from the rooftops of the villages. One would fly the kite and the other would be in charge of the spool. Together they would change altitudes and attempt to cut others' kite strings. The last kite in the air would be the winner and my mind would run to those rooftops, the very sand-ridden parapets he had described, imaginarily controlling the kite, with a friend handling the spoon behind me, together winning the kite fighter crown and my father being proud of his only son, all while I lay in bed with a grand imagination and not a single clue as to how to make the last thought a reality. So here he talks about how this is one of the happy moments of his childhood and how it contrasts with how he is now uh, yet at the same time i cannot take my mind off the kite thing and how like okay i know about kite fighting but i have no idea there were actually glass in the thread and that because i used to fly kite when i was a kid but it was just simply like flying the kite it wasn't anything about winning or something you just feel happy seeing that thing soar in the sky. That's it. But this one, uh, since it's actually for kite fighting, I kind of find it a little bit messed up. I don't know if that's what he's going for when he describes how, uh, okay, we're going to cut the competition's strings. Um, I don't know if that's the motif that he's going for, but I got a feeling that in a way that he, when he uses this motif, he's basically saying that um, in order to win the approval of his father, he has to become 
a winner and by becoming a winner it means that he has to sabotage other people's others lives i mean not in a serious way but in a way that he has to come out on top i can't help but think that this is why his relationship with his father went south he imagines winning the kite fighter crown and yet it just remains in his imagination because his gentle soul probably disagrees with this practice yes even though it's kite fighting sure like it, you're not you're not killing a living thing but at the same time it's just that when i focus on the image of glass in the thread i can't help but imagine and feel something that is negative in there if you get what i mean this one is actually my other favorite called Perch Sunflower Convertible. There is a bright yellow car that is perched on a building off the highway watching all of its own come and go. That car once which I stared at as a child wondering when the day would come where I could hop on in its cockpit and drive off the ledge, freeing it from its captivity. A drive down an autumn laden highway leaves flurrying around the roofless car hair mingling with the wind and gentle kisses from a sweet lover. Autumn drove past many times. My eyes would stop seeing the car that I admired, only able to remember it when I was on the highway, wondering when I would come back to it. And one day I came back to that car, riddled with dust. The building it stayed perched on painted with graffiti. Parts of me knew I had to come to terms, that I was too late to liberate it and parts of me ached as knowing the dream which I had kept hidden from the world as a child would never come to be. This is the one that I resonated the most and I think this is my favorite of all three collection. I just find it really fascinating on how he relates to this really small childhood memory, you know, obviously your childhood imagination is thinking like one day, one day I'm going to drive that car, one day I'm going to free it. I think I had similar feelings as a child as well. You know, when you see something interesting, you feel like one day I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But then as you grow up and then like life occupies your attention, those things move to the back of your mind. And so one day you just see it again and then you realize you've strayed so far from your childhood innocence and that amazing imaginations that you used to have and then you started to miss it you started to long for it you don't think it as ridiculous sure like at some point in your life think like at some point you must think like wow it must be ridiculous for me to like imagine i could drive off the ledge of that car but at the same time you begin to think that man those were simpler times for him at the very least that car is a symbol of his joy and his innocence as a kid and then to see that it is now riddled with dust to see that it is abandoned because he's like because he's grown it's like seeing old toys you know it's like seeing your old childhood toys laying in dust and unused all right so we have finally finished with fs yusuf now we're going to move on to the next collection we're gonna read Collections by Sana Abulayo. This collection is called Letters to the Person I Was. So Sana Abulayo receives an average of 3.7 stars, which I think it's still pretty good. And she presents a poetry collection of forgiveness, reflection, and self-love. Letters to My Younger Self is a poetry collection about the past, the present, and the future. It is a compilation of every word Sana wishes someone had said to her when she was a young girl, when she was struggling, falling, breaking, bleeding. It is a reflection of the responsibility she feels to say these words to everyone waiting to hear them. Consisting of four chapters titled The Naivety, The Refusing, The Understanding, and The Growing, the collection is meant to take the reader on a journey of pain and a hope, reinforcing the idea that life is always worth living. I think that Letters to the person I was, was not really my favorite in a way that, not that I think the poetry collection is bad. So I write a pretty lengthy review on this. So apparently this book is about uh, Sana blaming herself for terrible things that happened when she was a little girl. 
so in here like she talks about self-harm and stuff which i think is a very important thing to talk about just because you talk about an important issue doesn't mean that i can't criticize your poem if you actually read her stuff like most of these poems are really long they will always be like at the very least like more than 10 lines and i personally i appreciate that she's using all that she got but length does not necessarily mean good there are things about just like what i learned with just like what i read with fsu self there are times when i don't even like the whole thing i just really like one or two lines for example like this one the day you learn you're on your own will be a hard one when they grow tired or you're crazy you'll wonder why you aren't like them why your head isn't quiet why your laugh isn't louder but it's okay it's okay i think it'll be okay because i think they'll wonder why they're not a little more like you so again like i mentioned i don't really have to work for anything in here i'm just simply reading what she's conveying the lines that i like is the line why your head isn't quiet why your life isn't louder i love the contrast a lot of her poetry do not have like a proper structure in it some stuff i think some of the poetry should be divided i hate when like the image all of a sudden comes in the middle for example this one people aren't and all of a sudden there's this picture of this of the iv drip hospitals you whisper to yourself i wish that the illustration do not split the poem because it really did it really just it it just messes with me and i hate it however i'm going to read you some of the good ones that i like this one is my favorite a 12 december 2009 write read delete words are safe or at least they used to be now they're wood strong enough to build soft enough to burn kind of like you but a little more soft and a little less strong kind of like the home you keep tearing down because it never feels right, never feels like it should, never feels like you should. Write, read, delete. Let your eyes talk this time. At least they can't start wildfires. At least a home only you can see can't come apart. Write, read, delete, delete, delete. Always delete. It resonates with me because I think it resonates with a lot of people. You know, sometimes there will always be like, you want to vent, you want to tell someone something that you always wanted to say and sometimes it's not always a good thing you keep typing and typing and typing but then when you reread your what you're trying to say you're like that's like super mean so you just ended up not writing anything at all because you just want to save your relationship but because you don't send it because you don't express how you feel those words ended up becoming cancer inside of you figurative cancer of course i think what I really appreciate about this one is that how the repetition of write, read, delete, write, read, delete, and then delete, 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 always delete. I think that that's a really clever way to use it. I still feel like this poem should be split into stanzas, but this one is definitely my favorite in the collection. I love the motif of wood. Like, words are safe, or at least they used to be. Now they're wood, which is ironic because in the past, like, you write letters you use papers you know you use mails but nowadays we have social media everything is digital they're not exactly wood but they are wood in a way that they're a foundation to what you're going to be who you want to be or who you're supposed to be you know your profile on the internet in any or anything they're basically strong enough to make or break you words in the past they exist on paper i don't i want to read the other poems as well but they're just too long to the point where i think you know what i'm not gonna bother <laughs> so you guys can read it for yourself i don't think that it's a bad collection at the very least i think it has potential if she actually took the time to edit them or at the very least split them i think at the very least a few of her poetry should be split into two or three shorter poems okay next we have salt from naira wahid which is probably one of the more popular and the best collection so far initially i wasn't very impressed 
Number one, I think that it is only popular because Naira Wahid is quite popular apparently. I actually have no idea that she was popular until a few years back. But then, uh, I think it was a few Insta poetry recommendation brought this to my attention and I thought, well, you know, it looks interesting. Actually, the cover interests me because it is probably the simplest cover I've ever seen in my entire life. It has the average rating of 4.26, which I think is good. At first, I wasn't impressed because the poems are short, like so short to the point where I think even by Insta Poems collection, they're quite underwritten. But then, as I dug deeper, it actually has a lot of impact to it. It shows that you don't need long poems to create an impression. Like, Sana Abu Dail is overwriting. Well, Nairia Wahid might be underwriting at times, yet at the same time, I just feel like she has a lot of great motifs in here. Like, for example, this one. The rain in this room is low and thick, and I'm dressing my heart through the air. It's can away in the rain in this room, like, I'm talking wop, wop, wop. In fact, I actually highlighted a bunch of her poems. At first, I think like, wow, this is actually lazy. But then when I actually think about it, it's not lazy. She's doing this minimalist style kind of poems. And there are some that are actually quite amazing. The thing about this collection is that she is being very, very diverse about her topic. She talks about race. She talks about masculinity in a good way because I am sick of a lot of female insta poems that talks about masculinity as if it's a bad thing. They simply boils it down to men bad, women good, and something. But this is probably one of the first ones that I read that actually acknowledge that men suffer too. We all suffer, everyone suffer, and it is unfair for women, like especially the feminist women, to demonize men. You know, I, and they call themselves feminist, and I don't think that they should call themselves feminist because feminist is not about men hating, it's about uplifting women without trivializing males' suffering. This one, uh, she talks about, uh, there is no such thing as white African colonial black myths or revisionist history. White people are not Chinese because they are born and live in China. White people are not Indian because they are born and live in India. White people are not African because they were born and live in a continent they murdered their way into. I mean, I kind of agree in the way that I understand why she's thinking this way. My thesis is actually about African literature and I kind of understand why she's feeling salty. <laughs> There's some that are quite short, like too short to the point where it's not even a poem, you know, it's just a quote. She washes the sea on her knees. It's a quote, not a poem. Another thing that I want to note about Insta poems is that it all depends on your feeling at a time of reading. Because I think Insta poems is good when you are feeling emotional. When you're feeling like you needed someone to talk to, but there's no one to talk to. Because when I look back at my ratings for Insta poems and Goodreads, I realized that even though the poems are not that good, there are times when I give them high ratings because. I felt something when I read it. Before I open it, I was already feeling upset or I was feeling kind of depressed that day and I would resonate with the content a little bit more. So I was not really able to be objective. I love the motifs that she used. She has a great uh, physical motifs here. What will your eyes do with me when they're done? Will they lay me in the tender flesh behind the sun? Fold me into your memories back? Keep me a running water down, water down your arm. I love this. I, I love a lot of the motifs that she used. There's also something about language and belonging. I lost a whole continent, a whole continent from my memory. Unlike all other hyphenated Americans, my hyphen is made of blood, feces, bone. When Africa says hello, my mouth is a heartbreak because I have nothing in my tongue to answer her. I do not know how to say hello to my mother. I love this one because she's basically saying that she's forgotten her mother tongue. She's an African American, you know, but you know, when you have African, you know, people expect you to understand or at the very least be able to speak at least one of the African language. But then 
she couldn't because she was born in America, maybe even raised there. She also uses representations of Mother Africa, um, about sexuality, motherhood, the white standard of beauty, women empowerment. I would love to read more of her collection and I think I might even reread this one because it's it's an easy read yet at the same time it still provides me a challenge. Uh, I like the length even though some can be a bit too short for me to call it a poem but at the same time I feel like I can actually use it as an inspiration for my own writing so I think that's really cool. And last but not least we have Yesterday I Was the Moon by Noor Unnahar along with her twin sister who did the uh, illustration. I saved the best for last and this is actually my favorite. This is easily the best collection that I have read so far, not just in the area of Muslim poets. I love this one so much. The illustration has so much personality in here. It acts as a like a poetry in itself. There's the title poem here that I really like. I like the motifs that she used. Yesterday I was the moon, today just an eclipse. Something in me travels, some, day it's, some days it's too dark, some days it's too light. Um, I just love this collection. To the person who will want to fall in love with me, I have been a sky all of my life, full of life and light and anger. If you're not coming with thunderstorms, do not come at all. So it's just shows how she wants someone that matches her passion. She talks about hijab. Actually highlighted a lot of poems in here. Like she uses really interesting motifs of um, of rise, of weather, of nature, and she talks about belonging as well. And I think that just like Nairi Wahid, she experiences like this feeling of diaspora. There's this one that I actually like just as much. So falling in love with, with cities is risky. They'll welcome you with spectacular sunsets and stunning skyscrapers and a skyline that lights up the whole sky. But when they're angry, they will burn themselves down to fuel a riot that'll run loose on the streets. They will remind you that if you love a city with its lights on, you will have to love it even when it's on fire. I love how she refers to that cities can be energetic but at the same time very chaotic. She loves the city that she's in but at the same time she doesn't like it when it gets ugly, when the people inside gets ugly. I think this one has a lot of potential if she uh, talks more about this. I know that it might get a little bit political but I think it's worth a try. I actually want to read some more of her stuff. So I think that that is all for this video. I think I've recorded this long enough so I would highly recommend you to check out the last two that I have discussed which is Salt and Yesterday I Was the Moon. I think they're really great. You should definitely check it out and let me know which one is your favorite poem. I would also like to hear your poems as well. And also I plug in my social media as well. I actually am a part of the app Poetizer where you can actually look at my bad poetry. So I'll see you guys in the next video where I will talk about Shadow and Bond.